I'm, uh, I'm Chris. I'm Jeff. Both from uh, 8-Bit Brewing Company. We're partners in the business. And brothers. And brothers. My name is Daniel Taronis. I am the head brewer here at 8-Bit Brewing Company. Been here for almost two years. April 4th is when I started here. We opened December 15th, 2000. Actually, okay, we've been open three years. December 19th, 2015. It's gone very well. We, we outgrew our beer production capabilities faster than we thought we were going to. So we quickly jumped from a little three and a half barrel system with four fermenters to that same system with 12 fermenters to now a 15 barrel with 30s. And um, that happened a lot quicker than we thought it was going to. So, my start in this whole thing, it's funny, I, was, I wasn't even a beer drinker. In 2013, I, I mean, I'm pretty good with dates because it's, it's pretty crazy the way it all worked out. Um, 2013, I, was, I wasn't into beer much. I remember we went out one time, I ordered a vodka and Red Bull, and my wife now, girlfriend then, ordered a beer. The server came out, brought me the beer, brought her the, the, the mixed drink, and then when we switched them back, everybody just started busting up laughing. It was terrible. It was the most embarrassing thing ever. But it pushed me to then. So I immediately went to a beer store. I mean, I think it was like BevMo. And um, I just bought a bunch of different styles. And, and that day, I realized like how much just, I don't know, it was just crazy. It was a, there's so many varieties in, of beer that um, it started, it really intrigued me. And then my girlfriend then bought me a homebrew kit and it kind of took off from there. So started home brewing. I went over to work at um, a brewery here local, it's an electric brewing company. Worked there behind the bar with them from day one and then little by little worked myself into the, into the brew house, left the job I was doing, my full-time job, and um, stayed there full-time and then it just kind of kept going ever since. That was Chris and Lamar. Yeah, Lamar and I got into it uh, probably eight, eight years ago. We were home brewing down in Vista and a Mother Earth had just opened up, or they were open for a little bit. In fact, they were still brewing on a little, like a little five barrel system, and they were ramping up kind of like we have too, just growing like crazy. And um, they had homebrew supplies, and we were hanging out there. They ended up sponsoring our soccer team, so we got to know the owners real well, and he was sharing his tricks of the trade, and um, we were buying stuff and doing research and drinking our research, and that's where it all started about eight years ago. We were in construction for a year and a half before we opened. So back out another 18 months there. And then in concept, we were probably in concept for probably a year and a half. I ran into a coworker the other day who I hadn't seen for 10, no, I guess, well, I guess eight, seven or eight years. And he said, man, I remember when you were sitting in my office talking about this project. And he said, now you're here. And we'd already opened the 15 barrel system. So he's like, holy cow, man, like you went from talking about this in my office to here it is and it's done and it's working. So I guess that would probably be, so three plus probably, yeah, six, seven years ago. I think that like kind of Daniel's really in charge of his program. I mean, we're, I'm very much involved with like the marketing side of things, but Daniel does a lot of research. We try a lot of beer and I think we just kind of see what's trending and he's, he knows his stuff. I think he's passionate, I don't know. Yeah, remember. and then there's the balance of know your customer. Yeah, So as a, as a creative, Daniel being a creative, because brewers, let's face it, they're artists, right? So as a creative, you want to do what you want to do. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't necessarily sell. And so that's the balance of moving from a home brewer to a business is that 
you get to be a, an elevated brewer and, and be a master of your craft, but you also have to do it in a way that you can keep the doors open and, no. and customers come in and buy it. So I think the balance is knowing your customer, but also staying true to your creative roots to where you continue to want to come in and be better every time. Yeah. As far as the challenges are concerned, it's hard to keep a lot of handles on because you have limiting factors, which we've finally overcome all those limiting factors. So going back to your first question was kind of this timeline. Three weeks after we opened, we started running out of beer. So in February, we still had an Oktoberfest beer on or a pumpkin ale. It was a pumpkin ale, yeah. And we had, we didn't even have our own IPA. It was a pumpkin ale and a blonde ale. A pumpkin and a blonde, yeah. So like we're carrying Iron Fire, we've got Black Market, we've got all these local handles because people would walk in and go, you don't have an IPA? We're leaving. So we brought in guest beers until we realized we got to start brewing because unlike a burger, beer takes time to cook or to, to brew. And um, so the challenge was keeping enough beer on with a small system and a small amount of cold storage. So then that was our next limiting factor. So we said, okay, we want to keep a lot of handles, but now we have a storage problem. So having, you know, five, six barrels of 16 brands is a lot of space. So then we got the big system on still trying to use the same cold box so now we have our new cold box which holds a lot of beer so now we're able we're actually building up back to a good selection of 16 beers so the rotation won't be quite as frequent but still the goal is to have five or six core, core beers and then constant rotation of the others it's been it's been fun man it's been huge we um when we started we were on a four and a half barrel system and we were brewing about twice a week then maybe three times and about summer of 17 it really just started going like crazy it was insane um we were up to five brews a week and sometimes six on a four and a half barrel system with the brew pub you go through like we we've been blessed to go through a lot of beer um so we we beer sales grew substantially and um and then it was like it, the i guess the expansion was already in the works but it wasn't, there wasn't a date for it. There wasn't really a timeline, a fixed timeline. Once, well, the, once they, we really started accelerating produ production, it was like, okay, then this is definitely something we need to do. Um, so it's been fabulous. It's been crazy. It's, it's been one of the coolest rides ever. We've really, really grown a lot and we're just now hitting our stride in the brew house. We recently just finished it. I mean, we, we didn't have a cold box until about, I mean, two weeks ago now. So. So now we're actually going to be able to ramp up production and really, really get things, start working on more of the fun stuff, some, some barrel aged beer and, and things like that. But yeah, everything's been, it's been kind of a whirlwind, but everything's been, there's been growth, steady growth every single day since I've been here. Right now we're running a 15 barrel system so it's a 15 barrel abe system it's a three vessel so we got a mash louder combo tank kettle we have a boil kettle in the whirlpool and we built that so we could go more i guess efficiency really so all of our tanks except for two are 30 barrel tanks um so we we could either double brew into them or right now when production isn't it doesn't need to be at a high because we're only really just feeding this tap room um we're brewing all single batches for now but we have the capacity to go crazy. We have we have a lot of fermentation space and we size the cold box accordingly for that. The ultimate plan eventually is two or three locations, um, location number two and, and three eventually. And so this facility would then feed those two, those two other tap rooms or tasting rooms um, in the hopefully near future. the idea of the exclusivity, you know, having to come to 8-Bit to drink 8-Bit beers, just because if, if it's somewhere down the street, then why would you come here? And I think that part of the reason we've been so successful is our environment, and that's kind of what we're trying to capitalize on, is the experience you get when you come here. So that's kind of the, the challenge, too, the balance between the two. But putting it out there to get the name out there more, too, is 
appealing. I mean, you could ask any brewery that tells you they never change their, I guess their recipe is lying because you're making micro changes every time because you're trying to make it to a brewer, is the beer ever perfect? Probably not. Yeah, you we're know, still working on that. And that's it, been the day one beer. Yeah, so it's like every time it gets a slightly different iteration, but it's probably as close as it's you know going to get unless some industry-wide changes like us. I don't know what it would be, but so I think. Um, but yeah, I guess they do. Like we always have a Mexican lager on, but this new Mexican. Well, we we now always have a Mexican lager, but the new one coming out I think is different. So it'll be a Mexican lager, but a different Mexican lager. The Hef rotates between a couple. The red stays pretty true. True Brumant stays pretty consistent. Blonde does too at this point. Blonde we, stays we've only consistent. had two blondes, like one up blonde and. So yeah, so I guess really blonde core beer. Maybe blonde. we're talking more core style. Um, and then there are a couple within those that are truly core branded beers. But like more hot for your buck, obviously is is always on. But it's it's a rotating West Coast higher alcohol. I mean, it's just the under a double. Rotate on that one. But it's still branded the same. It's a rotating, um, but True Romance, James Blonde, Heifer Dead, those are the, the cores that are always on. I am a classically trained brewer. I went to, to school and, and what we learned is, you know, you do things right and you do them to, to have repeatability, not because you're a production facility, but because you take those techniques and you take those skills and, and you apply them because it's, it makes you a better brewer, it makes a better beer, and, and that, that's kind of the, the philosophy we go into is just do everything right the first time and make sure everything, you know, if, if we wanted to repeat that same beer, let's make sure that we're doing it according properly so we can repeat it. Um, but there's also a, so there's, it's also something very romantic about doing something, you know, one time and one time only, not necessarily not, you know, following the correct procedures, but just having something, you know, once. Um, so, and that's where like our stouts and our, you know, it's like, we we do we go through these processes that we've learned from from other brewers that we we respect and and look up to and a lot of these things we probably can't recreate which i think there's something beautiful about that um but the ones that we want to recreate we definitely we definitely make sure that we're focused on on all the details to make sure we can do that no i think i actually have a hard time saying this beer is perfect right so if I had to say which one of these beers is the best and I guess what I believe is the best of our ability, I think the Nilla is probably my favorite on the board right now. I think it's got the right body, it's got it's got awesome coconut, it was a bitch to brew, which was super awesome. Excuse me. Um, but uh, yeah, that one was, I think on the board right now, that's the one I'm most excited about. I remember Nilla, I walked in and the whole place smelled like coconut. One of the benefits of having a kitchen is, or having food is having a kitchen. So we get to like, we get to actually make our ingredients. So I come in and we have a, we have a slow cooker. And I mean, we've, they've got hundreds of pounds of coconut in there cooking at this low temperature and the whole place smells like bed, bath and beyond. And um, <laughs> I'm like, what are we doing? He goes, this is all the coconut. We're toasting this coconut for this beer. So that's cool. Next thing you know, we've got this hot back and he's got this hundreds of pounds of toasted coconut in there. And he's cycling this beer through it for five days straight. Just this constant filtration of, of this big dank, their big stout going through this like coconut. Like motor oil. Like motor oil, yeah, it yeah. really is motor oil, or it was. The decadent refill, since we got on our new system, I think that's the best double IPA we've brewed so far. I think it's, you know, there's a huge learning curve when you when you start on a new system and especially a system like ours, I'd never brewed on something so like designed to do what it does, right? So um, I had some exposure with it through through hanging out with people and, and going to, to other breweries and kind of checking systems out, but I never had brewed on it until something like, until this and my last system was a one kettle system, brew in a bag system. So it was, it was super primitive and, and ridiculously labor intensive. Um, so now I think I'm finally getting my feet under me with the double IPAs and are the hazies and I'm I, the decadent refill is.
probably the second one on the board right now that I think is like just money. I think it's it's on point. Um, there's a couple things I would change, but I would say that about every beer I brew. But I think it's it's the closest to what we're trying to do. The True Brewmance has been day one. When I came in for the soft opening, I wasn't, obviously I wasn't working here then. I came in and that was the beer that I was just like, bomb, super good. Like, rebrew more of that because it's gonna be gone super quick. Do you, do you remember the real story behind that? I, I went, we were at Carl Strauss and I brought home a six pack of their Mosaic Session IPA. I remember when we cracked the bottle, it was like, you could smell the Mosaic throughout the kitchen. And this was way back before Daniel was ever even there, but we were just, we were like, we gotta make a beer like this. And then that was kind of the original thought behind it. And we went, of course we went heavier, it was 7.1% versus the session. So it's got more body and there was just something about mosaic, it was dank, it was hoppy, not too bitter, the flavor's just right. It was it's the in hop. In hop. I mean, it was like the popular hop at the yeah. time. It got so hard to get that we ended up calling up more beer who's, you know, more on the homebrew side. They kind of dabble in commercial a little bit and we were buying it and by a half pound at a time and paying this stupid premium. But Rob hooked us up and he gave us somewhat of a discount. And um, of course our batch size was smaller so it wasn't, you know, and now we're double dry hopping. So it's changed a little bit as far as the dry hop but it's still true to Mosaic. But yeah, it was definitely Carl Strauss with the most motivation there. And then Justin from Electric comes over you know, he's sampling our beers before we open and he picked that beer out and he goes, I don't know what you did. He said, but whatever you did, do the exact same thing. Stand on one foot, look just to the left, pitch the yeast with your right hand. And he made this joke, but it's true because it's all about consistency in beer as far as repeatability. And those were, I mean, his words of wisdom was keep it clean and keep it consistent. So Lamar was our first brewer, um, and uh, he's really the creative type. He came from video games. Um, he was the one that he and I brewed in my unpermitted third car. Well, the third car garage is permitted, but what we did to it was not. We put a brew house, we piped in natural gas, we put in running water, and basically we're home brewing in this garage. But anyway, um, he was our first brewer, and um, he's also the, the creative mind behind the names and the and those, the, our ghost mug. Our resilience is actually, it's almost the exact recipe that Sierra Nevada gave us. Um, Sierra Nevada is one of those nostalgic beers, so when we got the email and, and that, you know, or when we saw that this was a project that they were trying to do, we jumped on board immediately. I mean, we were, we were super stoked. Now, it's a huge donation, you know, it's 100% of sales, right? So you're, you're literally doing this thing for free but it's for a great cause. So first I had to talk to my boss and as soon as Chris said it was a go and Jeff agreed, we rocked it. So we did the exact same recipe they did. Um, we played with the water profile a little bit. We used a tiny bit of Crystal 40 because we didn't have enough Crystal 60, which was what the recipe called for. So we did a blend of Crystal 40, Crystal 60, and then we double dry hopped it. But that is, I'm very, very proud of that beer. So the Mario Tsar, it changes, everything about it changes. We changed the base malt, we changed the, the sometimes it's bitter sometimes it's not we change the fruit every single time definitely the fruit changes every single time typically the abv will change we'll change the base malt on it um and it's just an experimental rotational series of of kettle sours and it's just it's an approachable beer we have the culture in Marietta is is growing up as far as beer goes, but it's still pretty young. You go to San Diego and, and I mean, everybody's versed. You go to any brewery in San Diego and everybody's versed in beer one way or another. Here, we're still trying to teach people. It's still our, you know, we're, we, you know, we're, we're working on spreading the word of, of craft beer. And because we have the restaurant, we have an opportunity to really hit a lot of people that we typically, that other breweries can. Yeah, the Oregon Pale right now is one of my favorite beers we have on draft. It's a uh, hazy pale ale, so it's got some bitterness, which I really enjoy in a pale ale. Um, but it's also really yeast driven and it's got a lot of those, a, a lot of the, the hazy IPA 
traits, but it's got some bitterness to it and it's sessionable. It's a smaller beer. I can have a few of them and not be tossed, right? I, I really enjoy those sessionable beers, you know, the lagers, the pale ales, the session IPAs. Um, and this one just has a ton of aroma, ton of flavor, and it's, it's just an easy approachable and, and I can drink a bunch of it, which is pretty fun too. So that's one of my favorites. People ask me all the time, it's funny, my mom just sent me an article the other day and it's like, oh, following your heart may not be the best you know, advice for millennials. And, and I, I messaged her back and I was like, mom, you're crazy. This is ridiculous. Like your son like literally did that, like, come on. Um, but you know, I definitely think it's more than, it's more than money. I, for me, you know, I, I was at an engineering firm that, was, that I made really, really good money. I still get people who don't understand the industry and understand what I do will still ask me like why did you leave you know the company you were at for you know for a bar but they don't they don't get what I do right i've i haven't worked a single day in in over 3 years i've i i hang out with friends and i brew beer it's yeah there's nothing like it i i genuinely enjoy i like being in the tasting room as much as i as much as i can because I really like to see people's reactions to, the, to when they take a sip of a beer that we just brewed. It's 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 pretty awesome when somebody just like takes a sip and then like almost like takes a step back and looks at the beer and then and goes in for another gulp. Um, I I really really appreciate that. I'm I'm not I'm not a person that goes out and I don't I don't you know, like to spend a lot of money when I go out. I, I genuinely, I, I mean, when I go out, I go to breweries. Me and my wife actually works here. She bought me my first homebrew kit. So we're, we're as deep into this thing as we can get. And, and it's, it's pretty rewarding to see somebody, you know, drink that piece of art that, that I spent, you know, a month creating. So, um, yeah, for me, it's, it's definitely not about the money. If I, if I it was about the money for me, I would have stayed, you know, at the last company I was at. I, I do this because I, I genuinely just love beer, love the community, and, and love sharing my passion. I think it's like a connection with a person, right? I mean, because when we first started this thing, I worked the bar every single day, and it's seeing people come in and building a relationship around something. I mean, people are coming here to hang out and have a good time. I think it's about more than just the beer. You can go anywhere and get a good beer. I mean, most places you can go to and get a pretty good beer, but I think you're, it's, it's, it goes back to the whole experience thing. I mean, for me, that's what it is. I, good beer is awesome, but you're building a relationship with the customer through a product, through marketing, through food and. Yeah, I mean, I'd echo that. And I like to build, like I'm a builder. I like to physically, you know, whether it be assembling a table or a chair or building a bar or building a beer or building a business. Um, I'm proud of what we do. I'm proud of employing great people and knowing that they're able to support their families and their future if it's a temporary thing and they're just going to school. Like, it's, it feels good knowing that the people that come here and enjoy what Jeff's talking about give us their money that they work hard for, leave tips for our staff, and then they turn around and they're able to pursue their dreams. So it's like, it's bigger than just beer or selling a product. I mean, it's, you're supporting economy and families and futures. And the crazy thing is we're doing that with beer, which is yeah. pretty cool. Just my younger brother, we're, we, we're separated by 10 years. And um, he's always been my younger brother. Now he's not because we're 40 and 30. I'm still his younger he's still brother. He's still my younger brother, but it's weird because now we're hiring people that can't drink. Yeah. And we have people that work here that are 18 and it was like, holy cow, we're hiring, you know, we get older and people stay the same age kind of thing, right? Yeah. There's a joke behind that somewhere. Yeah, sure. so, let's uh, not go there. All right, all right, yeah, all right, all right, all right. All right. <laughs> <laughs>